Hey you guys, it's Peter and welcome to my channel Peterisms where I tell stories of my life and just little things that I've learned as I've grown into the person that I am today. And um, I am making this video on Saturday and posting it on Sunday because first of all I wanted to make an announcement before I get into the topic of today's video. And that is that if you're watching this video on Sunday or any day forward after that, we are in Mexico for a little combined birthday trip. My husband's birthday was last Wednesday and my birthday is Thursday the 29th. So we are going to Mexico um, to just kind of enjoy a small little birthday trip. We're very excited about it just to relax and things like that. Um, sometimes before I go on trips, I pre-film videos for several of my channels. But this time I decided that I was just gonna film a video Video and let you guys know that I was gonna take some time off and um, this will be my last video for a few days and when we get back to uh, Indiana I will be filming my next Peterisms video so I just didn't want you guys to wonder where I was or why I wasn't posting videos and that kind of stuff um, I just want to take some time off and really enjoy my birthday and my vacation with my husband and things like that so we can really spend some time together um, that being said, I will still be posting on my vlog um, most nights. I don't know if I'll film every night, but most nights I'll still be filming on my vlog channel. Um, and a few of the days I'll be posting on my drama channel, my Peter Mon channel as well. Other than that, I probably won't be posting on any of my other channels. So just want to let you guys know that. So, um, I mean, I may feel spirited to make a Peter Dessa video or review a room service item or something like that. But... We'll see. That might just come up while I'm there. I don't know. But I wanted to let you guys know so you don't worry where I'm at. Okay, so I was going through the comments on my video, and I actually, like, screenshotted several of them that uh, for videos that I want to make in the future. But I received a comment, um, and the comment is... Uh, this was on my... Hold on just a second. Let's see which video. Uh, I have no confidence video. And if you didn't know, I have been making a lot of videos recently where I am responding to comments or questions that you guys have. And so I'm going to keep this person anonymous, but they said, I love this video. Thank you. I appreciate it. You said you were in treatment programs more than once for your addiction. I was wondering what was different about the last time that led you to being able to stay sober for the long haul. If that's too personal of a question, that's okay, and you don't have to respond. And it's definitely not too personal of a question. Um, I have been in treatment programs multiple times, uh, outpatient programs as well, and have been in counseling multiple times and things like that. This has definitely not been my first time to the rodeo. In fact, um, I shared about how I had successfully graduated from an outpatient program, and when I was on probation... And my dad, like, you know, had taken off, like, um, business meetings and things like that to attend the family program. And um, I remember the very last night when I graduated from the program and all this kind of stuff, they, um, when we were walking out, my dad, I, I think, like, they gave me a coin or something. They usually give you coins when you graduate from treatment programs. He, they gave me a coin and they all passed around and said something nice and whatever. And I can remember, like, my dad, we were walking out and said something like, let me see that. And I said, it should be an Oscar. And he goes, what do you mean? Well, I had started drinking, like, a month prior to that and had been going into it. And I, and I kind of thought my dad, like, knew that or assumed that or whatever and I said well I've been drinking for a while my dad was so upset like that was really the beginning of the end of my dad like like he really started to see the truth for what it was the last time that I got sober um I mean I think there was a combination of reasons why it lasted the long haul my dad is a huge part of why it lasted um I will say I think that one of the reasons why I was really sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was kind of at the end. I mean, every day that I was waking up, I was using to get to the point. I mean, I, I would wake up every day. I had DTs, delirium tremens, where I would shake from like the alcohol leaving my system. I had to drink to just get to where you would see me as normal. Um, so every day, like I have this, you know, regimen where I would like drink in the morning or whenever I got up, which typically wasn't the morning, but I would drink. Um, I would eat several Vicodin. I would smoke weed just to get to the point where I could kind of function. And then I would do that throughout the day. Um, and then I would, you know, meet up my friends later that night when they ever got off work or school or whatever. And um, 
So, and then by that point, was I had been using so much throughout the day that I was very close to blackout. So it was only a couple hours where I would like go with my friends and party and then I would blackout. And that was just kind of like my everyday thing. So by the time that I went into treatment, which I went into treatment because I wrecked my car and um, I put my car in a ditch and I called my dad and my dad came out and my stepmom took me to the treatment facility and um, so I like literally like tested positive for like everything across the board like you know all this kind of stuff and um, my stepmom was like please just because I was like so resistant to going into treatment she's like please just go in please just go in I, I don't really remember a whole lot of that but I do remember her looking at me and saying please just go in and I didn't even really have any kind of idea how bad it was I just knew that I was so I mean we have a saying of being sick and tired of being sick and tired like I was so tired of just trying to keep up with um, doing what I had to do to just function on that level like you know I think we have this idea that addicts and alcoholics are really lazy people, which I think is true to some degree, complacentness and laziness, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort to stay at that level of drunkenness and highness pretty much round the clock because if you don't, you're going to start getting sick, you know? Um, you have to constantly be coming up with money. You have to constantly be, like, buying things. You have to constantly be thinking, like, two days ahead. Like, okay, if it's a Saturday night, like, back in the day when I was, you know, drinking age, um, or even before that, you know, liquor stores were closed on Sundays in Indiana. They aren't anymore. But we would have to think about that so that we, we would buy alcohol on Saturday days or Fridays so that we would have it till Sunday and then not drinking it before so we could make it last so that I had enough alcohol on Sundays to get me through Sundays. Those were, or holidays, because liquor stores were closed on holidays too. So those were a lot of the things that you think about. And it takes a lot of work to be that sick of a person, right? And I was so tired of it that when I finally got into treatment, and I really wanted to check myself out, and my neighbor was my nurse in the detox unit, and she was like, you're really sick. Once I kind of had just accepted that, and I like had this full-out fight on the phone with my dad, and I was like, come get me out of here right now. And he was like, I'm not coming, you know, whatever. I've called all your friends, and they're not coming to get you, and all this kind of stuff. And I've called your mother, and she's not coming to get you. And once I just kind of knew I was stuck, and I just kind of accepted that, that was when I kind of learned to shut my mouth and open my ears because I realized that anything that I was going to say was going to get me into trouble. So I was in detox for about seven plus days, seven to nine days, and then I moved over to the rehab unit. And that was where I had like group therapy and everything on a daily basis. And, um, you know, the first week I was completely resistant to everything and I was so sick from detoxing. The second week I kind of fought a little bit and by the third week um, I really had learned to shut my mouth and not say anything. And so I started hearing other people's stories and they started really sinking in. And when other people would share their stories, no matter where they came from, no matter what their backgrounds were like, no matter what drugs they were using, if they were different than me, no matter how their lives looked different than me, what I realized was I was not unique and that my story was very similar to them. And that I was just like, what we were going through, how we were hurting people, how we were hurting ourselves, how we were selfish and self-centered, all of it was very, very similar. I was not unique. And what I realized from these people, some of these men that I was in treatment with, you know, that I was at the time 22 and a half, and they were 50, 60 years old, and had been through 10 to 15 treatment programs, you know? 10 to, they, I mean, they knew everybody that worked in the treatment program because they had been there, let's say, 15 times, right? What I realized was that this was not gonna stop for me unless I stopped it. I was in treatment over Christmas and New Year's, and um, I, I didn't want anybody to come visit me. And on Christmas Day, two of my friends surprised me and come and visit, came and visited me. And when I was talking to them, they were telling me about a lot of people that had come into town that had moved away. And they were telling me about a friend of mine that had moved to New York City, and he and I used to party a lot together. And they were talking about how he had been working for, like, Bon Appetit magazine, and he was had just bought an apartment, and he was real successful and things like that. And, um, and telling me about other people and, like, what they were doing, and they had been describing graduated from college or we're going to college and all this kind of stuff and what I realized in that moment was I was like the party stopped and nobody told you like you're still out there acting like the party is going on but like the party stopped other people are moving on they're adulting you know they're settling down and like you're still partying like the party's going to go on for the next 20 years 
And I really realized that in that moment, I was giving up so much of my life. The other thing that happened was that something occurred while I was in treatment that last time. My dad had been very enabling and very compassionate and loving to me before. And something happened while I was in treatment that time and he was very, very angry. And I think a lot of it had to do with my stepmom because I think my stepmom had kind of had it. You know, she had gone through this deal in her history and her past with like friends and family members and things like that. So she knew a lot about like people using drugs and drinking and, and putting you through that. And so she was kind of like educating my dad on setting limits and boundaries and he didn't want to do that. In fact, like a week before I went into treatment, my stepmom said something because my dad was giving me money. I said, you have to stop giving him money. And my dad said, I'm afraid if I stop giving him money um, that he'll start prostituting or stealing. And she goes, how do you know that he's not doing that already? And to some degree I was. So, you know, like I think that my dad, when I got into treatment and he knew that I was in a safe environment because he felt like that many times when I was in jail too, he would feel, say that he felt like I was in a safe environment for at least the night. I think it was it allowed him to become so angry and allow me to see how frustrated, disappointed, and angry he was and how much effort and work and money that he had put into trying to save my life through the years. And he just was done. Like he was done. You know, and I think to some degree he kind of buried me while I was in treatment. Because he came to me and he said, like I'll never forget, when I got out of treatment, I had to sign one of, sign one of these behavioral contract kind of things that said like, you know, you'll go to so many, uh, 90 means in 90 days, you'll have a sponsor, I can talk to your sponsor, my dad. Um, you'll go to therapy twice a week, you'll go to aftercare, you know, all this kind of stuff. You'll submit to random drug screens. And I can remember at the bottom of it, there was nowhere where I signed it. And um, the one thing they wanted me to do that I wasn't willing to do, which in retrospect I wish I had done, is they wanted me to move into a halfway house, the doctor and my dad. And there was one halfway house in Indianapolis at the time, and it was that St. Vincent Stress Center, and I didn't want to go there. I had, like, I was like, no, you're not going to put me there. Um, in retrospect, I've had so many friends of mine that had really, really, I've had, you can use anywhere you want to use, and I know, and I know that I, I know people that have had bad experiences in halfway houses, but I also know people that have had fantastic experiences in halfway houses. Um, so I went, um, I went back to my apartment, but before I went to my apartment, my dad was still paying the bills and things like that. Um, I had this behavior contract and I remember sitting there with my dad and the doctor and looking at it and I said, where do I sign it? And my dad looked at me and goes, you don't sign it. And I go, what do you mean I don't sign it? Because I had always had all these behavior contracts in the past that I'd sign it. He goes, you don't sign it. He goes, if you don't agree to it or you break one of the rules on there, leave your keys on the counter and, and get out. I'm done. I'm done with you. Like period in a story. And he was done, right? I really think if my dad hadn't allowed me to see how angry and disappointed he was, I really believe if my dad had not set such strict limits and boundaries, I don't believe that I would be here today. And I really think that is what made the difference. I think my fear of being homeless, I think my fear of not knowing how to take care of myself, I think the structure that was provided for me, that it was so easy for me just to follow these things, I think all of that allowed me, and also the ability to set up a foundation for my recovery of going to meetings every day and things like that, allowed me to stay sober. And I think that's why I'm here today. I think that's why this time made a difference. I think I had to really see how I was hurting people and affecting people. And I'm glad that they didn't stand in the way of that, you know? I'm glad that my family and my friends let me know that they were disappointed in me. Um, not a lot of my friends, but a few of my friends let me know that they were really worried about me and they were really disappointed in me. You know, I think the thing that was the weirdest to me was that my closest friends, even the friends that I was using with, the closest, like when they, when things came out and they found out that I had been like smoking crack cocaine and things like that, and like they were like, Peter, I didn't know that. And they're like, that really worries me. Like, I mean, we were with you all the time when you were out and where were you doing this? And I was like, well, I can, the last night I went to this alley and, you know, smoking crack with this guy in this alley outside the Vogue and, you know, broader pool in Indianapolis. And they're like, but we were with you that night. Like we're, you know, and so like they were very scared because what they realized was there was a life that I was presenting. There was a life that they were aware of. And then there was a life that I was keeping hidden from everybody, even my friends that I was using with. And I think that that was terrifying to them because what they realized was, that they were trying to control what they could and help me. The other thing I, I, I think I realized was there were a lot of people that I used with back in the day that I thought were really problem users, which they were. Um, I unfortunately had a lot of friends of mine that I used to use with back in the day that have since passed away from overdoses and things like that. I've also had a lot of close friends of mine that I do believe at, they were substance abusing for a period of time. I do not believe that they're addicts or alcoholics, that they have stopped and gone on and they either don't use at all or they have a glass of wine here or there every once in a while, you know. 
and they're very high functioning today in society and they're successful and they own homes and have kids and are married and things like that, you know, and, and they just kind of stopped partying, you know, at some point. Um, I wasn't able to do that. I, I think I needed to be removed from my environment. I think I needed to be removed from the people. My counselor, when I was in treatment, she also said, you're going to call your friends that you hang out with and you're going to tell them that you can no longer hang out with you, which most of them were kind of like, they didn't really understand why I was calling them. Um, and I can remember that was like a huge deal deal for me. I think had I not done that, I think I would have very much like gotten out of treatment and manipulated that situation. I think it was a combination of factors, you know, that kind of all lined up and came together and really helped me to be successful and for um, me to still be here today. And I think, you know, I, would, I think fear kept me sober this first six months because I was so scared <clears throat> of... Um, of going back out and using and being homeless because I knew my dad really meant it. And I knew I had like no friends' couches to sleep on. They were all done with me as well. So I knew I had really nowhere to go. And so I really was just staying sober out of fear. And then what happened is at my six month uh, point, I got my six month coin and I remember walking and I went to a meeting at the treatment program that I went through. And I went out and I was standing in the parking lot and I remember standing there in the sun. It would have been around, around this time. And because um, my sobriety birthday is... December 17th so it would have been June 17th or something like that and I can remember standing outside in the sun you know and um being like holding this coin and being like you have never done anything for six months in your life consistently let alone stay sober and I had all this peace and serenity as a result right like people weren't telling me what I did the night before like I talked about in my blackout video people were you know coming up to me and telling me that I looked good and that I looked better you know family were starting to trust me again and things like that and call me and seemed pleasantly happy to have me around you know things like that I was making friends that I could trust and not a lot but just a few um you know and I went to bed and remembered going to bed and I woke up and I remembered waking up and my house was clean and my sheets were clean and my clothes were clean and you know it was just it was a different way of living for me and um and like we say in recovery it was like looking through the world with a different pair of glasses and um I felt blessed. I felt very, very blessed and very happy. And it was like the first time in my life that I felt ever felt that way. And that I realized, I think in that moment, I can do this. Like if I did it for six months, I can do it for seven months. I can do it for eight months. And I can remember I kept a calendar in my kitchen, in my apartment. And for the first two years of my sobriety, every single day, I wrote down like one, two, three, four on each day of like how many days I was sober. I counted for the first two years. And I was so proud of each and every single day that I got. I'm still proud of each and every single day that I have sober, you know? Um, and so should you. I love that so many of you in the comment section just recently said that somebody said they had six months sober and somebody else said, you know, something else. And it's like, it's so cool to see that because... I think for a lot of people that read that, what they see is it's just time, it's just a date, six months, six days, six weeks, six years, you know? It's a life. You're saving a life. You're saving your life and you're saving other lives. And you're now choosing to affect people in positive ways, you know? It's amazing. It's amazing. You're a miracle. You know, we're all miracles. And, um,. So anyway, I hope that you enjoyed that. I love that. You asked that question because I think it's a very important question about what makes a difference when we finally make pivotal choices in our lives that affect us in positive ways. I think it's a good question. I think that could be a question I could ask myself about many different things. That like, well, so what happened this time finally, you know? Anyway, um, let me know what you thought about that in the comment section below. I love you guys and I'll see you when I get back. Bye.